Okay, we're back. Welcome to another episode of The Millennial Entrepreneur. My name's Sina and I love following the journeys of other young entrepreneurs. And in this episode, it's a very special one, I spoke to Sabrina Stocker, semi-finalist of the BBC's Apprentice. It was an amazing chat where we talked about what life has been like before and after the hit TV show in terms of her business and her personal brand image, along with personal branding advice for young people listening. We talk about how she's ventured into business coaching and even celebrity business coaching. And of course, circling all the way back to where it all began with her tennis business, which is still running successfully while she only spends 20 minutes a day on it. And she covers how she achieved this. As always, thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast. It really is a pleasure recording episodes like this and I really hope you enjoy it as well. As I mentioned on the previous one, uh, every week I'm going to do a shout out for someone who's recently reviewed the podcast on Apple Podcasts. So if you want to feature in the next episode, be sure to leave a written review along with your name, otherwise I won't know who you are, and I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. So this week, we have a review from Tara who says, a great host and interesting interviews. I'm particularly interested in social enterprise and sustainability, thus my favorite two are the affordable washing machine designer and the idea of using human waste for energy production. Thank you so much for the review, Tara. And yeah, those two episodes I was immensely proud of as well. I'm really glad that you enjoyed them too. And so yeah, if you like Tara want to feature on the next episode for a little shout out, be sure to leave a written review with your name and I'll be sure to leave you a shout out. So yeah, let's get on the episode. Hey Sabrina, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. And it's good to hear that your voice is sounding all right because I know you're doing loads of like webinars at the moment. Uh, it must be quite like straining on your voice, right? Honestly, yesterday I was um, hosting one of my personal branding webinars and I had to just stop halfway through and <laughs> get some water because I, I just talk so much. Um, <laughs> I've talked so much recently and I need to give my vocal cords a break sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, what, what, what the webinar on? It's on personal branding, right? Yeah, so I've got um, the Sabrina Stocker Academy and I'm teaching kind of startups actually how to start a business, right? Um, and a lot of that is to do with personal branding and being able to get me more clients through personal branding. So I've been diving in deep with that. All right, yeah, sounds really cool. Is there any like one sort? I mean, we can kind of like talk about it a bit later, uh, but just just for now, is there like one thing about personal branding that you can that you can share with everyone? Um, probably be authentic because I feel now people try to be who they think people want them to be. But actually, you've got to stay true to yourself because as soon as you're more authentic and as soon as you show that you're genuinely putting across how you are in real life on your online life, that's when you're going to start thriving and doing really well. Yeah, true. I I actually find that so like the authenticity is really valuable. Like I've I've got in the first few episodes of my podcast, like I didn't feel it was authentic, but now as like time's gone on it's really the authenticity that resonates with people. Yeah, 100%. You know, people don't want to, people want to relate to people. And the only way that you're going to relate yeah, to for is sure. not showing how amazing your life, but it's showing the struggles of your life. And people get inspired when they see you overcoming those struggles, not once they've seen you made it. Yeah, exactly. It's really good to hear. So for the rest of the podcast, we're not going to talk about The Apprentice that much because I think it's just a bit dead to like talk about it all the time. You must talk about it so much, right? Yeah, I mean, I do get asked about The Apprentice a lot um, and I can predict every single question that's going to get asked. <laughs> that was actually my first question. What is the most common question you get asked about The Apprentice? That's my that's my cop out of not really asking about it. Yeah, I mean, probably, you know, do we actually get up at 4am every day? Yes, we do. And actually... Um, you know, I'm, I've also started this thing which is called 86,400 because you have 86,400 um, seconds in a day and it's all about starting your day really positively and having a morning routine, which is completely the opposite to the way that it is in The Apprentice House because <laughs> I love having my early morning routine, but actually when you're getting up at four and you've got the producers shouting at you to get ready in like 20 minutes... Um, yeah, it's quite an intense morning routine, should we say? The only the only question 
I actually just wanted to ask you about The Apprentice, but it's nothing really that like, it's the only specific one about The Apprentice, apart from that, like, it's more sort of general stuff. But um, I remember watching it and I remember in in the sort of early challenges, I feel I felt like people didn't really take you and your opinions, your ideas seriously. And I think that's kind of a common theme that we've that we talked about on the podcast with the young entrepreneurs where their ideas and, and opinions aren't taken as seriously as someone say who look maybe even just looks a bit older, might not be as experienced, but just even just looks a bit older. How do you get people to take you seriously? Um, I think the reason why, you know, that was portrayed that way was maybe because they were making me look like the dark horse, but also I'm young, I'm bubbly, I'm excitable. And sometimes when you are that outgoing and positive, people don't see the serious business side of you. And it was only until I started getting results that they did. And I, I knew that they were taking me seriously because I was voted the most amount of times as project manager or sub team leader ever. So obviously they did look up to me as a leader, but I don't think the uh, producers played it that well in that way. How, how has life sort of changed before like from before the apprentice to how it is now because i remember listening to one of your podcasts that you that you did with like a friend of mine and you talked about how i might have misheard this correct me if i'm wrong but how you changed like your friendship groups as uh like during the process yeah how, how that will come about yeah i mean my life's massively changed if i look where i was three years ago it's completely different but it's not changed because just the apprentice it's about how you perceive the world and for me I see everything as an opportunity doesn't mean I say yes to everything but I see it all as an opportunity and it's allowed me to have this you know publicity storm and because of that I've been able to work with a lot of young entrepreneurs help them start up their own business and for me that's that's more rewarding than anything yeah yeah for sure how does it feel being like more in the public eye that you talked about because I had someone on on the podcast before he was on Dragon's Den and he was saying how, like, as soon as Dragon's Den aired, he got so many online trolls, which I thought was, like, mental. He was only on it for, like, five minutes as well. Yeah, I mean, if you think of The Apprentice, you know, we have eight million people watching that a week. But I was really fortunate. I didn't get any negativity. I got less than five negative tweets, which, for me, is insane. Like, that's so positive to come out of The Apprentice. Really? Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty good, actually. One thing actually that I did stumble across, and <laughs> like I, we could edit this out if if you don't want to talk about it, it's completely fine. Uh, but I, like you, you talked about it on your like Instagram as well, so I, I thought it'd be quite funny. And um, so I was basically researching you, and I went to page two of Google, which is a dangerous place to go. And there's like a website with like feet rating stuff. I'm like, what the what was going on here? And I was just like bursting out laughing. I was like, I don't know if I can ask her this, but well, have, fuck it, it's funny. Of, uh, feet fans, shall we say? So there was a collation on Wiki Feet of my feet. <laughs> there you go, boys. How crazy is that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw it and I was like, what? This is. I thought all the sort of stuff on Google was going to be about The Apprentice, about your businesses. But I mean, it was fairly high up. You'd be surprised how high up this is compared to like other stuff. <laughs> yes, um, I do have a, a fairly uh, interesting following there, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on. Um, so I remember as well on, on the other podcast, the, you talked about how important your parenting was in getting confidence and that's something that, again, we've talked about on the podcast where, you know, young young people in the early stages, they lack the confidence to kind of like pursue a lot of the, a lot of the things that they, they want to go towards. So how important was that sort of parenting? And if you don't have that, how can you gain that confidence? Yeah, great question. I mean, for me, my parents were both teachers. Um, and yes, you know, I've got an Indian mum. And if you have an Indian mum um grades are the most important thing in the world and if you're not a doctor or lawyer then you know what have you done so I had an Indian mum from that side and I had a really (laughs) really creative dad who just let me get on with my own thing and they were really supportive because they just let me do what I wanted to do and they gave me the opportunity to to try things and by trying so many different things from such a young age I was able to spend my time doing what I loved and I was able to know what I loved because I tried so many things so that for me was was a big 
I think part of the way that I am now. And if your parents aren't so open minded, then ultimately, it's your life, you are the one who is calling the shots, you are the one who is taking control. And whatever situation you're in, you've got to make it work for you. Because as much as we love our parents, they're still just human beings, there's no right or wrong on parenting. So if you're not in an environment that's making you happy every day, or that you're able to have these opportunities, then it's your job to go out and find them. It's your job to go out and create them. And nobody is going to create those opportunities for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's really important, I guess. Like, it must be it must be quite difficult for some people. Like, I come from a, a Middle Eastern household. My parents are both Middle Eastern. And you talk about your Indian mum. And I guess, I think parental like standards and what your parents think and they're sort of like what they think you should go into I feel like yeah it is it can play a big role so how can you kind of like fight those expectations if that makes sense I think it's not about fighting the expectations but it's about understanding where they're coming from and when I say that I mean there's a reason why your parents are the way that they are and that's because of the way that they brought up their experiences in life Um, how they're feeling. And it's really important for you to to make those calls, but to to do it in a way that you're speaking to your parents like you're on their level. It's really easy to get frustrated and to get out. And I was that, (laughs) that kid who would just argue all of the time with her parents because I didn't explain (laughs) myself. And as soon as you start explaining, then they're going to listen. But until you get to that point where you can be level with them and not get angry with what they say, even if you don't like it, that's when you're starting to open up those conversations that may change. Yeah, no, that's definitely, it's really important. Yeah, for sure. Um, So like, that's where your confidence came from. And how can you kind of like maintain that confidence but also like like motivation and just the overall mindset of pursuing goals yeah I mean pursuing goals and motivation I've been listening to um mindset gurus can you say like Tony Robbins and Brendan Richard since such a young age and actually yeah you know, that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm motivated because there was 14 year old me listening to a 40 man 40 year old man um, as I was going to bed, I was like, why are there no young singles? Um, why are there no young females who are single and thriving and doing really well to represent the younger generation? And I feel that social media is slowly starting to get there um, in the motivational world. But, you know, you've got to figure out what motivates you. And for me, it was to be able to inspire others to start their own business. That is my biggest motivation. And until you can understand that why, what is the purpose of you being on this world, you're never really going to be that motivated because motivation is something that you can burn out really quickly of. So unless you have a deeper reason about what's driving you, it's always going to be a temporary thing. Yeah, no, that's really important. And that goes back to, I think, when you when you talk about like co- uh, like wanting, you know, inspiring the next generation of entrepreneurs, that goes back to the sort of, I think on your LinkedIn, it was the, the, the KISS approach that you teach. Yeah, so I, I teach a method called um, Keep It Simple Sexy. It originally was Keep It Simple Student, which um, stupid, which is an economics term, but I like the sexy part. And it's basically, <laughs> everyone tries to overcomplicate things. And there's no reason why things should be overcomplicated. Running a business isn't hard. You've just got to know the right strategies. And as soon as we start to break things down into smaller problems, then we're able to tackle them, then we're able to overcome them. So rather than getting overwhelmed at the thought of starting your own business and where it's going to be in five, 10 years time, just think about what you can do today. And then that's keeping it simple. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? You just have to kind of break down the problems and kind of, yeah, just just go simple one day at a time, Go, go to the simple problems first and then build your way up. Is that basically it? I wouldn't say simple problems. I would say, what do you need to do today to move you forward as a question? Let's okay. say that I have um, Sabrina Stock Academy that I've launched. So I've got, okay, what do I need to do? I want to build up a community. I want to build up a following. I need to write all the content. What do I need to do today? Okay, I'm going to design my logo. Next day, what am I going to do? Yeah. Write content for my website. And by keeping the steps simple to get there, even if they're easy or you don't want to do them, or even if they're hard, it doesn't matter. 
but making them into smaller steps will mean that at least you're moving forwards rather than just thinking about it. Is this the same sort of like frameworks that you would teach to like celebrities? You do you do some celebrity business coaching as well? Yeah, it's the same. I mean, with with celebrities, it's about being a, they've got an audience already, right? So they're in a very different place. And it's about being able to monetize their audience, they're following in a way that it's going to do good to society. So it's, it's very different depending on who you are, what your background is, and what your experience is. There's no yeah. kind of one solution. But who's like the biggest name that you've, that you've coached? <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I'm not going to mention any names um, because I'm, you know, quite quiet with my clients. But um, there's been some pretty awesome people I've worked with. Are there any things that you coach them that would be applicable in the sort of like wider context of people that haven't necessarily been on TV and have that platform already? I would say the biggest thing that's stopping most people start a business is their limiting beliefs. And as soon as you can understand what your limiting beliefs are and listen to them, then you're able to start tackling them. And that's when you're going to start making big moves. And your limiting beliefs can be anything from, I don't know how to do this. I'm too young to do this. People won't take me seriously. All those thoughts that kind of just stop you going in your pain. Yeah. And as soon as you start to recognize that you're saying them over and over again, then you're like, okay, that doesn't make sense. And I'm not too young to do this. I am fresh and I'm eager. And by changing the way that you're wording things, makes a big difference rather than saying I don't know how to do it therefore I'm not going to do it you say I'm going to learn how to do it yeah yeah definitely and one thing that I actually learned from I mean it's in a similar sort of stem from a Harvard professor he he said if you put stuff in third person so if you stop saying I and say your name the problem doesn't look as big and those limiting beliefs don't look as like significant to yourself because if you say stuff in third person, it's not as focusing on yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's really helped me with my limiting beliefs. Yeah, that, that's a really nice technique as well. I like it. What sort of limiting beliefs have you had in the past that you've, that you've overcome that you're really proud of? Probably my biggest limiting belief was I'm too young to do this. And that was, yeah. you know, I was younger. I was always told, oh, Sabrina, you're so young to do The Apprentice. Oh, Sabrina, you're so young to be speaking <sighs> on stages next to... Uh, you know, the likes of Piers Linney. And I'm just like, well, actually, I'm, I'm not too young. I've, I've done it. I've been there and done it. I've got something to talk about. People listen because <laughs> I've done it. And yeah. until I'd done it, that I felt like I could be there. But in reality, I could have been there a few years ago if I just had started sooner. And my advice to anybody listening is just start. Because what's the worst that can happen? I guess it's, it's difficult because some of those limiting beliefs... I guess you have to like originate where they come from and sometimes they get fueled by you know other people saying you can't do this yeah I mean as soon as you see somebody in your life that is not bringing value to your life is not supporting you then you've got a question are they the right people that you want to be surrounding yourself with now we've all heard the phrase you are like the five people that you surround yourself with most um and it's true to an extent because you want people to be on the same journey as you. And even if your friends aren't like that, it doesn't mean that you don't need to be their friends. It just means that maybe it's time to start looking for other people who you can inspire to be like as well. Yeah. Is that what you would, is that what you have done in the past? Because I'm just thinking about the actual, like, uh, like the actual practicality of it. How, because I've, I've also done it in the past, but it is quite difficult to do. Yeah, I mean, I have um, definitely gained new friends. I've, I've lost friends just because, you know, we, we go different ways and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think especially, yeah, you know, you, it's not about being right or wrong. It's not about you being more than your friends. It's about you being surrounded with people who are going to support you doing no matter what you do. And it's also about you being able to support them too. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great advice. And I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that I, I learned that quite early on because the the people that you surround yourself with like massively important. It's important with, with so many things like, like your motivations to do certain things with your goals. Uh, that's what I found. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's really, really good advice. Um, so kind of moving on to your... Uh, the, the businesses that, you, that you've launched. Uh, the one that like, really caught my attention, especially in recent times, I'm not going to say the C word, but in recent times, uh, is with 
the shopping slots uh, business that you've launched? Yeah, so basically, you know, I'm, I feel like an entrepreneur isn't a business owner, it's somebody who's constant, constantly coming up with solutions to ideas, um, solutions to problems. Um, the biggest problem um, we had, well, one of the biggest in the UK was being able to secure a delivery slot, especially for people who were self-isolating or, or vulnerable and elderly who couldn't get to the shops. So our website was kind of like a, a go um, go compare. So rather than being having to go to all the individual supermarkets, you go to one supermarket, uh, you can search your postcode and you see what slots are available in your local area. So that was my uh, COVID project. Yeah, no, when I came across it, I was like, yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, this is like a perfect solution to what's going on right now. And uh, like, I tried to find delivery slots, just like, it was impossible. So yeah, it was, it was a really cool idea. And um, so how sort of like popular was that? It was ridiculous. It made um, all of the regional and national press, uh, we had like 3.5 million page views, half a million users. Wow. Yeah, it's been intense. It's been intense. <laughs> Have you had to like dedicate a lot of time on onto that, which is just managing the sheer numbers? So a lot of people uh, approach me and ask to take a percentage of the business and work with them to expand it. So in terms of the technical side, I have no technical knowledge. Um, and Jason, the co-founder, it was his idea, his technology. I just got people on the site. Um, so for me, it was you know press marketing, and because I've done it so often. I, it was, you know, it was okay. It was fine. But I worked hard. Like the two weeks before we went to press, I was putting in 18 hours a day. It was all I was doing every single day. What was like, what was the sort of like day to day in the lead up to the, I guess the launch, that's when you, you reached out to all these, these guys in press. So what was the sort of like day to day in, in, in launching this product? It was get up in the morning, 6am straight on the laptop, um, finishing the prototypes, redesigning the content on the website, contacting press, getting PR article out, creating social media. It was basically starting a business <laughs> within a week. And then imagine if you started a business and a week later, you've got over 100,000 people on your website at one time. You know how crazy that yeah. is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's, that's crazy to think, isn't it? But I guess in a week, that must have been a really exciting process to be a part of. It was amazing. It, it definitely gave me my buzz back, a bit bit of a, an uplift in isolation, should we say. Yeah, for sure. And I guess that's really, I mean, I guess that I was a bit a slightly different to your business from before, was the, the my tennis events. Yeah, so my tennis events, fortunately, we're really lean, so we'll continue as soon as we can. Um, but my tennis to tournament company runs about 400 events a year. We've got a team of 42 uh, we partnered with David Lloyd, Virgin Active. So it was completely different to my event company. But change is nice. Yeah. Change. Yeah. I mean, you're still working on that. And the, the thing that kind of like took me back was how you said uh, that you only spend like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. You said, oh, I can't remember the exact number, but you don't spend that much that, that much time on it a day. And I was, yeah, like, how does that, how does that even happen? Um, hard work, but <laughs> no, yeah. I literally created systems and processes. So all I had to do is check in, but the actual company ran itself. So, you know, I'm, I was 24 years old having to work 15 minutes a day, loving life. So actually I'm, I'm really grateful in a way that we have had lockdown because it told me to, to start something new and rather than just getting by, which was fine because I could and I didn't have to work in a sense. Um, it's now allowed me to spend my time doing another project. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, those those sort of like systems in place, is it sort of like a, I'm trying to like work out the actual specifics of it. Is it kind of like a structure that you kind of have to do, the, the team has to do every day or every week or whatever? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a very set routine. Um, and then they've got all of their tasks and they have to be completed on certain days and logged on. I use monday.com as my process management system. I would highly recommend it. Yeah, it's a uh, very systemized. I think that I think monday.com is actually free for students. So if any students are listening, I don't know, take, don't take my word for it. But if any students are listening, uh, be sure to check it out. Uh, I don't know if it's free, like for sure. But I th yeah, check it out why not? 
Um, and I saw on, on my tennis events there's speed dating as well. Yeah, we're starting a match made in tennis. So for any singletons out there, uh, <laughs> it's such a nice concept. So rather than going to a bar and having a drink to meet somebody yeah. with them. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. It definitely makes sense. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but like people go on dates and it can be really, really like awkward, especially if it's like a blind date or like, I don't know, if you've just gone from like a dating app, it could be really, really awkward. But I guess with if you have tennis, that's an activity and it just breaks down those, it just breaks the ice. No, exactly. And if you are... Uh... If you have had enough of speaking to somebody, then you just move on to the next tennis court. <laughs> it must be quite brutal. Like, how does that work? It must be quite brutal. Like you play tennis with them for like, and then you just you just move on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously structured in a way that is allowing everybody to be happy uh, and to get on with each other. And worst case scenario, at least you're getting a game of tennis, right? Where did that, I mean, I know you've talked about this before on, on other podcasts, but I'm really interested to hear about like how the whole process of starting my tennis events came about. Because was, was that your first business? So my first business actually was um, a young enterprise scheme. And at my school, we had to create suites. Uh, actually, my first freaking business idea was Sarah Ann's business idea, who won the year before me of The Apprentice. So um, that, that's oh. quite ironic. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, my first business was selling sweets um, as part of a young enterprise scheme. And then uh, my tennis fence was my second business. Oh, okay, okay. So how did, how, did the, how did the idea come about? I was coaching tennis and I was doing pretty well at 19. I was earning, earning like 40 pounds an hour. And when you're earning forty pounds an hour at nineteen, like you're loving life, I spent so much money; it was yeah. ridiculous how much money I spent. And um, yeah, I just was like, okay, I want more. And how do I get more? Well, I'm not going to earn more if I, you know, just continue doing this because there's only so much you can earn per hour when you're physically doing a job. Yeah. So I thought I'd have to start a business. And what could I do? Well, I loved events and I loved tennis. Hey, I could run tennis events. So you basically just like employed other people to do like events for you and then it just kind of expanded from there? Exactly, exactly. I'd, I'd form the relationship with the venue. Um, I'd bring staff in to run the events and then I would just look after all of the operations in the background. Mm, that sounds really cool. Have you actually had like, have you thought about taking that sort of structure into other into other sort of businesses? So not just tennis, but like events in general? Um, I have done, but I think most of my time at the moment is being spent on the the academy and at least that way you know it's able to inspire the next generation and I think for me that's my bigger purpose goal at the moment rather than just events yeah yeah so if I mean my audience does comprise mainly like uh, yeah it's mainly like young young you know the next generation that you talked about so if, if there's sort of like one key message that you want people to take away from this the young people listening what what would it be I would say be bold and the reason why I say be bold is because if you want to be different, if you want to make something of your life, if you want to excel in comparison to what everyone else is doing, then you can't be doing the same as everybody else. How can you do the same as the person sat next to you and expect a different result? It just doesn't work. So if you want to be different, if you want to make a difference, then you've got to do something that no one else is doing. And you can explore that in any way that you'd like, but it's only you who's going to make that choice. Nobody's going to tell you to go stand out, to go, you know, 10x whatever you're doing, to be extreme in whatever you believe in. But until you are extreme, then you're just going to be doing a similar level. And if you want to be the best, then you've got to do something different to get you there. Um, so how, like, how do you do that? How do you, yeah, how do you do that? I think you've got to find out what you love and then you've got to think, okay, how am I going to make the biggest impact doing that? And the reason I say why you love, because running a business is hard work. And if anyone tells you it's easy, it's, it's not easy. Um, and if you do it fast, then I'm following them. No, but running a business is hard work. So you've got to be able to do something that you love, that you're passionate about. And by when I say kind of scale up what you're doing, you've got to be every single second of the day has to be focused towards what your end goal is. And if you're spending hours a night watching Netflix or you're 
um, spending hours just scrolling on Instagram, like think about the amount of time that you're wasting, which could have been done towards something that you love. I'm not saying don't watch Netflix. I'm saying you've got you're the only person who's going to decide how you spare all of your your spare time. If you're studying from nine till three, you've got three till nine to be doing something else that you love. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And this is something that you've kind of that you really want to take in the education system, which I think, you know, uh, the education system is so outdated in a lot of different ways, not just, you know, there's no sort of, you know, teaching entrepreneurial entrepreneurialism, but it's outdated in so many different ways. And it's really cool to hear you also recognize that it is, it's, it's, you know, it's outdated. So how, I know you can't give like loads away, but how, how are you kind of like, yeah, uh how yeah how are you injecting entrepreneurialism in the education system yeah well i'm starting this thing called active dragons which i'm really excited about and that's about teaching the four c's so communication creativity collaboration and critical thinking and by teaching these and embedding them into the curriculum system you're therefore able to teach um, students how to think rather than how to pass an exam right so it's a mixture of that and it's also yeah. looking at um, camps, workshops, where people can build a business. Imagine going to a residential camp and playing out The Apprentice for a week. How amazing would that be? Yeah, I'll be sick. <laughs> I'll be so good. <laughs> right? So that's that's what I'm forming. And we were meant to launch this summer. Um, but oh, no. Next yeah. Next summer or potentially next Easter, if you want to have a trial at The Apprentice and start your own business, then holler me at Active Dragons. Is it just so it's, it's, it's for school, uh, like school age students, right? Uh, seven to 17. And then we're also going to be doing one for 17 to 21. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so how can people kind of like stay in track of that? Um, I'd probably say follow me on Instagram, Sabrina Stocker. But and then I'll be releasing things back to Dragons. But I don't want to release too much about it at the moment just because we've unfortunately had to pre- uh, postpone our launch. But I'm very excited yeah. for the launch. It must be so annoying you've had to postpone it because I guess like everything must be like, it must be ready, right? So it must be, must be really annoying you have to postpone everything. It's okay. I've had opportunities to do um, really exciting things as well. So I would, you know, even with that language, it's annoying. I'd say, well, I can do anything about it. So therefore, what's it done? It's given me more time now to do something else that I love. Yeah, no, you're really right. Yeah. And do you teach, uh, well, do you intend to include other sort of, um, I don't want to say lessons, but just like workshops, I guess, would be the, the most appropriate term. But yeah, sort of ways for people to learn, um, ways for students to learn in schools, stuff like personal branding that you, that you also talk about. I think so. I think at school, you know, kids have so much ready that they've got to learn. So getting that into the curriculum just physically wouldn't be possible. Um, and I've already looked into the option. But being able to teach um, relatable life skills is something that I think teachers would, you know, massively benefit from Um to, to include in the curriculum too yeah yeah for sure and i think for the last <clears throat> the last sort of like 10 minutes or so um it'd be really cool to talk about personal branding um because it's something that we haven't actually touched upon too much in the podcast and uh yeah you, you do a lot of like workshops on it and you talk about it a lot how important is having a good personal brand yeah i mean personal branding for me is one of the most important ways of how i've got there um, personal branding now is especially important because when you when you want to know something about somebody what do you do you go on social media you go on the internet yeah. and as sad as that is that's the reality so rather than you know you've got to now think okay what am I, anything we want to do, if you want to have a job, my employer is going to check out what my online presence is. If you want to start a business, my investor is going to check out my online presence. And it's about being able to create yourself online the way that you are offline. Yeah, for sure. I actually learned this, I haven't shared this story before, but I actually learned this story the hard way. Um, I was like, what, 15, maybe, no, young girls, maybe like, yeah, like 14, 13 or whatever. I once I had a like work experience and I was in like the interview process for it and it was at this like bank that I like at the time it was my dream job now now it's not but at the time it was and he was really interested and then the next week he said 
yeah, I found something on Twitter that you posted that I didn't really like. So yeah, we won't be going forward with, with your application. And my, like, it wasn't like anything bad or anything. It was just, yeah, it was just, I think it was a bit outlandish. And from there, I realized how important it was to have a really good sort of presence online. Yeah, I mean, I've fired people before because of what they put on social media. So, you know. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. At the time, I was really young, so I didn't really realize. Yeah, you know, like anyone who is posting on social media, that stuff's going to stay there, you know, and you don't want it to bite back. So I'm not saying that you sh- I'm just saying you should be careful. But personal branding isn't just about being careful in like online. It's about how can you use your online presence in order to get credibility and that credibility is what's either going to get you clients or it's going to allow you to start a business yeah yeah so how can you ensure that your social presence and your personal brand like gives you that credibility yeah i mean there's so many strategies that you can do for personal branding um and one of the biggest strategies i think is you know what's the reason why you want your personal brand to be good online And then deciding how you want that to come across. So the why is, if you're looking for a job, it's going to be very different to how you want your brand to be if you're trying to start your own business, right? Because your employer doesn't want to see that your employer wants to start their own business. So figuring out your why, which can change, um, is the most important thing. And then every single time that you go online, does your online presence reflect what that why is? And by doing those two simple things, you're able to really push yourself to the next level fast. It sounds like it sounds like it's one of the, like for for something like social presence, right? I think it's something that people don't really think about. I think about it a lot because of my experience when I was younger, but it's it's something that I don't think people think about enough and they don't give enough time for. Um, but you're right. It's, it it sounds like something you should definitely sit down and actually think about your why and also like plan out how you want your social presence to be, right? Yeah, I mean, think about how much time we spend on social media. Like, we spend so much time on social media and it's becoming the norm to do that, right? Um, When I, you know, see my friends, you know, a few years ago, we wouldn't have our phones out, but now I see kids, you know, teenagers, and they get their phones out and it's normal. (laughs) Whereas with me, if my partner got his phone out, or like if somebody got a phone out on like my date with him, I'd be like so put off by that person. And it's one accepting that that is the norm. And because it's now the norm, you know, you've got to be careful what you're putting out there. You've got to start thinking about it. And how can you utilize it as well? It's a big opportunity. It's a big platform that you can make something of yourself on. Yeah. So for people who are planning on starting a bit, because you talked about this like I don't know, like two minutes ago, for people who do want to start their own business, how would their so how would their personal brand differ from those that want to to get a good job? Um, you know, if you're starting a business, then you want to um, basically whatever your business is going to be, people are going to be buying into you, right? So you want them to hear your story and it's all about storytelling. Whereas if you're looking to um, get a job, then they it's basically just a tick box exercise and you've just, it's more risk aversion rather than being risky. Okay, I got you, I got you. So people that want to start a business, what are sort of like tips for them to utilize their uh personal brand to their advantage i mean business is such a big term but i'm gonna narrow it down a little bit if you want to for example become a a job that's reliant on you as a person so a pt a coach um something that they're buying into you then you know you've got to make sure that your social media is reflecting what you're about now if you want to start a business which is not nothing to do with you um, you've got to think, okay, if someone's going to buy off me, what if they Google my name, what's going to come up? And by, yeah. by knowing exactly what specifically you're doing, uh, I do talk a lot about this on my social media in a bit more detail, then you're able to know what the end result is. But it massively differs to, to where you want to go. Okay, cool. Well, I think like we're running out of time. So yeah, thank you so much, Sabrina, for coming on the podcast. And I hope uh, I didn't ask too many the apprentice questions because i know you get absolutely bombarded with them left right and center 
every podcast that you go on. No, you know, it's been so lovely speaking. And I definitely think, you know, people should be inspired by you because you're going out there, you're doing something different, you're getting in touch with other people that you either want to be like, or, or you think that you're on the same path as. And it's, it's a really powerful journey that, you know, people aren't just looking up to, you know, people that you're interviewing, but they're also looking to you. So well done on that. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you have a really nice rest of the week. And I hope for sure that um, you definitely get the uh, entrepreneurialism stuff in, in, you know, promoting promoting it for younger people because i really think it's needed yeah i'm uh, fingers crossed i will work hard to get it there i'll speak to you in 12 months <laughs> how done. so how can people how can people stay in touch with that whole journey and you in particular going into the future sure i mean my biggest and most active platform um is instagram which is sabrina stocker.r if you want to see out some of the academy courses sabrina stocker academy.com um and also twitter which is sabs underscore underscore stocker okay cool thank you thank you for joining me again and yeah i'll see you later amazing thanks bye thanks for listening to this episode of the millennial entrepreneur uh it was a really interesting talk with sabrina from the apprentice and i definitely learned a lot uh and if you enjoyed please be sure to leave a written review five star rating on apple Podcasts. it really does help me out if you've got any feedback as well, that'd be amazing. You can uh, you can put that in the written feedback or you can message me directly on the uh, Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast uh, Instagram page. I'll put the link in the description. So yeah, again, thanks for listening. My name's Vincent. I'll see you in the next episode.